Um, my name's uh, Owen Kalaki, and uh, along with my colleague Jung, we're co-chairing this next session. Um, and it's a great honour to be able to introduce uh, Marita Nordentoft, who probably doesn't actually need an introduction in this context because she's um, been one of the, the, the main figures, I think, in the, in the history of uh, early psychosis research um, over the last 20 years. And in terms of the, um, the theme of the whole conference, I'm very much looking forward to this talk because I think this talk is going to encapsulate this exact theme very precisely, looking back and moving forward. So thank you, Moretta. Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for coming back from coffee. Um, it is true I've called my presentation Achievement and Future Perspectives for the Early Intervention in Psychosis and it fits very well with the theme of the conference uh, looking back moving forwards. Uh, so uh, when we intervene in uh, the field of psychosis it's possible to do a lot of different things and, and I, here I've listed some of them and I'll come back to them. Uh, and uh, I'll only look at the yellow ones in this presentation because it is an early intervention conference and not about uh, uh, late interventions. But I'll uh, start with uh, the treatment of uh, first episode psychosis. Sorry. Um, and some of the achievements we have made in this field is that we have proved that early intervention services are uh, effective and acceptable and uh, attractive. Uh, and I think uh, uh, there's now solid evidence for the effectiveness of early intervention services in the treatment of first episode psychosis. I think we are at that stage now. Uh, uh, we conducted a meta-analysis some years ago where we proved that the risk of readmission uh, it can be reduced if you are offered early intervention services compared uh, to standard treatment. And at that time we found four clinical trials uh, that we could uh, base our meta-analysis on. Since then, uh, Christoph Corell has uh, done a meta-analysis. He has presented it at conferences and I was allowed to borrow some of his results. It's not published yet. Uh, but he had a meta-analysis based on uh, 10 studies, uh, a lot of people, 2,176, uh, and uh, he found that early intervention services were superior to usual care regarding discontinuation uh, of treatment, and it was very solid uh, evidence for that. It was uh, uh, the risk of rehospitalization, it could also be reduced, and then uh, vocational re rehabilitation uh, could be uh, increased. And I think uh, the discontinuation thing is very important, and that's why I've brought this drawing, uh, where you can see that uh, a lot of work can be done in order to maintain contact and establish contact. And I think David Fowler's presentation just before uh, the break was a great example of that. Uh, back to Chris Correll's meta-analysis, he also showed that the, uh, the early intervention services were more effective uh, regard, uh, compared to usual care regarding uh, symptom severity, psychotic symptoms, negative symptoms, general symptoms, depressive symptoms, uh, and functional outcome, and finally quality of care, uh, quality of life. Uh, so he found that it was an overall, uh, that it, it was in many domains that early intervention services uh, were more effective. And of course the Opus trial which uh, I started out with uh, was part of it, and uh, I'll briefly mention the results. I promise I won't tell everything again. I know many of you have heard it before. But uh, we had a trial in uh, Copenhagen and uh, Aarhus uh, where we randomized uh, 547 patients to uh, early intervention services or standard care. And we followed them up for one, two, five, and 10 years. And we are in the process of applying for funding for a 20-year follow-up. Uh, actually, I'll take this slide out, but when we, Mirella started to talk about instruments the other day, I thought I'd bring it back to, to show that it is about different instruments playing together uh, and a lot of different uh, um, professional backgrounds playing their role and uh, making things uh, fit well. Uh, so we want to build an instrument that could play different uh, keys and tunes. The treatment elements, assertive community treatment, family involvement, and social skills training, and uh, a lot of uh, home visits, and a lot of phone calls, and also text messages. I think that's 
it has become increasingly clear that that's an important part of uh, keeping in touch with uh, uh, people with mental disorders. And then I brought a picture of my son when he had his uh, first day at school. Um, before that day, he asked me, do they have an Elizabeth in school? And um, I, I didn't know very well uh, what he meant with that. You know, um, it can be possibly threatening to go to school and a uh, new environment and how to, uh, how to behave there. But what he asked was if Elizabeth, uh, if there was an Elizabeth, and it could be a kind, reliable, accessible professional whom you can approach, whatever kind of problem you might have. And the, the person he was uh, thinking of was uh, uh, the pedagogue in his kindergarten taking care of him. So he wanted to know if she could be uh, replicated. And <laughs> I think that, um, that, that um, way of thinking we will also bring into mental health care. We would like to have a reliable person that you can access and who can help you with anything. So that's the, the case management part of it, that we want this person to be accessible and uh, also be able to help you with every kind of problem. And then we also involve the multifamily groups, uh, psychoeducational multifamily groups, uh, inspired by William McFarlane and supervised by Anne Fiel. And as I told you, we uh, randomized 547 patients into two groups, and we followed them up after one year, two year, five years, and 10 years. And here we have the, the main results, uh, and a picture of Carsten Jordhoi, who did a lot of work with this. Um, what we can see about the main results is that with regard to functioning, this is the GAF, the split GAF score, the, the dotted line are standard care, the full lines are uh, opus treatment. We can see that functioning is better in the first two years, but we can also see that it levels out. And we can see that um, the symptoms, they are here, the negative symptoms, the psychotic symptoms, the disorganized symptoms, they are reduced more, and they are reduced more rapidly in uh, opus treatment, but after five years and 10 years, there's no longer any effect. Of course, we were glad to see that there were these effects while the treatment was still going on, but we were also a little bit sad or disappointed that um, it, it didn't last. Uh, there were some effects that did last, and it was the effect of the ability to take care of yourself. Uh, so this is uh, the number of days spent in supported housing uh, in the Opus team in the Opus treatment and the, the, among the people who receive standard uh, treatment. And you can see that uh, there's an effect here that they are more able to uh, uh, stay in ordinary uh, apartments uh, and not staying in institutions. So, and, and that's actually a huge uh, thing, uh, not at least with regard to money. We had a health economist who calculated uh, the expenses in the two groups. And what she found was that uh, the expenses for hospitalization was uh, lower in the Opus group and also the expenses for uh, supported housing was lower. So these are institutions. So that was lower in the Opus group. The expenses for outpatient care, it's here, it's the Opus teams, it was larger uh, compared to the expenses in the community mental health centers. And the other expenses were more or less the same. So what you can see is that uh, it's possible to save uh, 24,000 euros, 40, 24, euros per patient during the first five years. So when I uh, tell the politicians this, they are sometimes very alert. Uh, but I, I think it is uh, important also to calculate the, the savings, even though I agree with both Pat McGorry and um, uh, Norman Sartorius, who says that um, we shouldn't, if, if it was better, uh, we'd pay for it. So it's not necessarily that it should also save money. Yeah, but uh, now we can uh, claim that Opus is a perpetual motion that can provide funding for the rest of psychiatry. <laughs> yeah, but how long should uh, specialized early assertive intervention last? There's a symposium uh, tomorrow uh, um, afternoon where Nikolai Albert uh, will present the result of a new trial we have conducted where we have compared two years of treatment uh, with five years of treatment. And there are several other trials around the world where they have compared, uh, where they have compared two different lengths of uh, durations of treatment. So what we have done is that we have randomized 400 uh, patients into opus, prolonged opus treatment or transfer to standard treatment. And um, we succeeded in uh, follow uh, uh, to conduct follow-up with 72%. Percent. 
if you want to hear the results, probably you should attend the symposium uh, tomorrow, but I'll just take you briefly th through uh, some of the main findings. We did not find an effect on our primary outcome, which was the negative symptoms. Uh, we were disappointed about that because we, found, we thought that uh, the effect on negative symptoms was very important in the first OPUS trial, uh, and that negative symptoms are so important for functioning and, and uh, uh, the prognosis in the long term, but we did not find that. Uh, and we did not find significant effects on the psychotic uh, dimension either. Uh, and um, also when we only looked at those who had uh, a psychotic condition, even though it looks as if there's a difference here, it doesn't reach the level of significance. It could um, maybe be a power problem, but we will have to re uh, realize that it's not uh, significant. Um, there were some effects on the, the subjective reporting from the patients. Uh, the effect on working alliance, the patients from the OPUS trial were much more satisfied with the, the alliance with their, uh, their therapist, and also the client satisfaction uh, were, were, was higher. But there were no differences in level of functioning and uh, not in general self-efficacy either. And with regard to uh, uh, employment, we didn't find any uh, differences. It, here it's, uh, it's recorded every week, uh, but you can see it fluctuates and it's not convincing that opus is better than treatment as usual. And of course there were some differences with regard to service use, but they were not as big as we had expected. It might partly be because uh, some of the, the standard treatment has improved and they are actually providing more services uh, than they've done previously. They, they offer more visits. Um, yeah, or it could be because Opus wasn't as effective as uh, we thought it would have been. But we are calculating on the figures now to find out whether it is more or less expensive. And it's not, uh, actually, the, the, the fact that, there are, I know it's not significant, but there are fewer bed days. Uh, it, it could be that um, the, the uh, expenses were not, um, that, that the, the treatments were not more expensive, even though it was an intensive treatment that was extended uh, for three years, for another three years. There were uh, effects on adherence to treatment. You're not surprised to see that because it's an assertive uh, intervention and you are, uh, the patients also wanted uh, the, to take part in the trial. There was a very high uh, participation rate in the trial. It was 90% uh, who wanted to take part in the trial. So in that way, you would also expect them to like to stay in treatment. Yeah, so uh, still I think we can say that we have uh, solid evidence for the effectiveness and we still have some issues to sort out uh, with regard to how long should it last and who should have longer treatment and, and who could, uh, uh, for whom could it be enough with two years of treatment. So the future perspectives, if we look at this phase of uh, illness, the early, uh, the first episode psychosis, I think one thing is implementation of early intervention services. There could also be something about including more treatment elements. There could be experiments and there could be expansion to other mental disorders. But first about the implementation. Uh, um, Mayanna Milo uh, presented yesterday a, the results of uh, the implementation investigation in Denmark. And what we found out was that it is now implemented all over Denmark uh, with the various degrees of fidelity, but generally I think we could say that it is a acceptable fidelity uh, to, in, in many regards. Um, uh, we have also seen that there's an increasing uh, incidence of psychosis. Here's a picture of Thomas uh, Monglauersen who did all the analysis. What we can see is there is a, um, the, in the period from 2000 to 2012, the incidence of psychosis in Denmark has increased with 43% for women and 26% for men. So in that way, in that, uh, therefore there might be an increasing need also for early intervention services. Okay, but uh, and yeah, and uh, with regard to implementation in Denmark, the Danish uh, regions has endorsed uh, treatment packages. Uh, so now it's a civil right you could say, to get treatment uh, for first episode psychosis if you present with a first episode psychosis to Danish uh, uh, health services. I won't go through this, but it's, I've just shown it to you to uh, uh, give you a picture of the details, uh, of the level of details, uh, how these uh, treatment packages are uh, uh, described. 
And I think we were, of course, very uh, nervous whether this would just be a minimum and everybody would go down to the common denominator and we would face something that would be worse. But I think what we've got is something that can safeguard uh, the treatment and also ensure that it can be uh, available in uh, all parts of Denmark. Then I wrote a few friends uh, all over Europe first to find out where uh, do we have early intervention services. And I think uh, it is striking that it is in some countries and in some countries it's not at all. And I think, uh, yeah, it's thought provoking that, uh, that uh, some countries have very well developed early intervention services and others do not. And if we go to different uh, parts of the world, we have uh, Australia here kindly provided by Ian uh, Kilaki and uh, Pat McGorry where we can see uh, the early intervention services around Australia. And this was kindly provided by Bob Heinsen, who yesterday uh, showed us the, the dissemination of early intervention services all over uh, the United States. And uh, in 2018, it will be 187 teams, so we are looking forward to that. And then uh, Canada, uh, I had some information from uh, Ashok Mella, Donna Laddington, about uh, the level of uh, implementation of early intervention services in Canada. Uh, and if we look all over the world, we have uh, also a um, uh, star in uh, Brazil. Uh, this uh, was information provided by uh, Brazil Rodrigo. But what you can see is that we have, when we look all over the world, we have a lot of stars, but we have also huge area where uh, there are no uh, early intervention services and in some cases also no other services. But I think um, we, we, need, we need to think of how we can disseminate uh, and, and implement things all over the world. Actually, I think we should have some, such a map on the um, uh, IEPA website where also people all over the world could report these stars because it's, it's not that easy to get that information. Okay, so uh, how to take it further? I think uh, we have evidence. So that's why I've ticked this off. And then in each country, there should be national guidelines, treatment packages, or other decisions that could uh, uh, ensure that the evidence is transformed into at least a guideline. And then political influence, uh, promoting the idea, lobbying, promote and ensure political decisions, try to make government uh, make starting grants. That has been the case in both uh, Denmark, UK, and uh, uh, Australia and uh, US, that there's been starting grants several times. Uh, and then make sure that there is educational material, handbooks, manuals, videos uh, explaining how to do it, and training courses. Uh, when Mayan explained about the uh, fidelity yesterday, training was, uh, where, uh, training was a critical point where a lot of activities were lacking. Yeah, fidelity scales, accreditation, national and international conferences to share ideas and keep up the good spirit. I think it is, a, a forum like this is really a great inspiration for us all. So I'll say just do it. <laughs> That's an encouragement uh, to you. And um, many politicians are sensible. I know it's a critical statement, a controversial statement these days. But, uh, but still, I think you can find politicians who will listen to you and collaborate with the NGOs and user organizations who will indeed want this. Yeah, and then uh, this person will have to do it over and over again. <laughs> it's easy for us, yeah. So including more treatment elements, uh, I won't have time to go into all this, but I think it is really uh, encouraging to see that supported employment is added to a, a lot of uh, uh, early intervention services. Lifestyle changes uh, is also a theme. It's difficult. Uh, we have a, a symposium later today where we show our results of, of a trial where we didn't succeed to introduce lifestyle changes. And it, it is more complicated. We should think uh, this uh, very uh, thoroughly through. Treatment of comorbid substance abuse, I think we still have uh, a lot of evidence to create in that area and a lot of uh, ideas that needs to be developed. CBT uh, is uh, very well demonstrated and also CRT, cognitive remediation therapy. But then I think there could be two uh, new things. One thing I want to mention is uh, one thing we have in Denmark called the Opus Panel. And then I'll also touch upon dose reduction. But the Opus Panel, it is an initiative that uh, came out of one of the multifamily groups. 
I think multifamily groups are great because people, of course, they learn a lot about mental illness and they do a lot of problem solving, but they also bond uh, to each other and they, uh, they uh, um, feel that they are not alone in the world. Uh, some years ago, we won a prize, the Golden Scalpel, and we were, of course, very happy about that. But I was almost as happy when I got, uh, I didn't get that one, but one of the case managers got the green Stanley knife. And <laughs> it was one of the patients who awarded her with the green Stanley knife. Uh, so I think uh, we, we are in a situation where the patient really value the treatment. And this is another expression of that. It is the patients who have uh, made uh, our, uh, our name with the pearls. It's, uh, yeah, it's pearls. Um, and then the OBUS panel, it is a group of service users and relatives who want to tell how it is to live with an invisible disorder. So they meet every second month and they decide who should give talks. That's, that's what they, they are doing, they're giving talks. So they decide, decide who should give talks on introduction courses for staff members, who should give talks in psychoeducational groups for patients and relatives, and uh, who should give talks to new paper, interviews to new newspapers. And then they are rehearsing uh, their presentations and give a very respectful uh, feedback. I was attending one of these uh, meetings uh, a few months ago, and I was really touched upon the. Uh, I was really touched by uh, these uh, uh, personal presentations, and I think it's it's uh, therapeutic in some way that, that you tell how it was for you, and somebody else listen very carefully, uh, and and you are and you are given feedback. So I think they are playing a very important role in fighting stigma. And I think such initiatives should uh, be encouraged. Yeah, and then dose reduction. Uh, I'll present this, this is part of the PhD uh, study from uh, Stephen Austin. Uh, he looked at the 10 year follow up and now he's not looking at the differences between opus and standard treatment, he's just looking at the whole group as a cohort. And what he found was that there is a group 13% uh, of the patients who every time they're interviewed, they almost score a maximum level on uh, the psychotic symptoms. It's a combined score of uh, severity of hallucinations and severity of delusions. So they, they are, um, they're really disabled. Uh, and the, but luckily, it's only 13%. And when I, I'm going to tell this to my uh, psychiatric colleagues, I say, and you think it's all the patients, but it is only 13%. Uh, I think that's the, you often perceive it as if it's more or less hopeless and things like that. Uh, we were talking about that yesterday, but uh, it is a, a per percentage here who are very disabled. But the majority, they are actually down here. Uh, oh, it's 47% who rapidly after uh, first contact are without symptoms. This is questionable, so here we have a very low level of symptoms, and it stays like that uh, until the 10-year follow-up. And we also have uh, some who have a delayed response, uh, who after five years are in stable uh, remission of uh, psychotic symptoms. And if we add these two together, they are actually uh, the majority. And I think um, this is an important take-home message. I know that this is based on approximately 70% of the patients because not all attended all follow-ups. Uh, but, but still, I think we can say that in the long-term prognosis, at least with regard to psychotic symptoms, it's better than we have thought. Uh, and we also looked at uh, whether they had medication. And uh, then I had two uh, students, uh, uh, Dieter Goldfressen and um, Regitze Wils, who uh, Looked, who uh, divided patients into whether they were receiving antipsychotic medication or whether they were not, whether they were psychotic and whether they were non-psychotic. And they did that with all the assessment we had in the OBUS trial after one year, two year, five year, and 10 year. And um, then the combination of this with medication and psychosis, it created these four uh, categories. Those who were in remission, it's not only that they are remission, they are in remission without medication. And these are responders, they are getting medication and they are not psychotic. These are psychotic not medications and these are psychotic in spite of medication. So if you try to remember the colors, the pale blue ones are the ones who do not get medication and still uh, are not psychotic. So what they did, they analyzed uh, the results uh, after one year, two year, five year and 10 year. And what you can see is that there is a proportion who's not getting medication and who's still not psychotic. 
and it's, it's actually growing a little bit, but it is about the one quarter. Uh, so I think that's a, a, a relief, more or less, uh, of, of which, which think that uh, I don't think we would have expected it to be such a high figure. On the other hand, we can also see that there's a more or less constant proportion who is psychotic uh, in spite of, of medication. Uh, we know that the medication uh, helps to prevent uh, relapses. Here's a meta-analysis conducted by Steve, Stephen Lloyd uh, and published in Lancet some years ago, where he clearly shows that if you compare continuous treatment to um, uh, 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 stop of medication, you, there's an increased risk of relapse. On the other hand, you can get rid of the side effects at least, uh, but but there is an increased risk of relapse. And then uh, I think we have all of us, or many of us, heard uh, the trial conducted by um, uh, Lex Wundering, who published it in JAMA in 2013, the seven-year follow-up, where he found that uh, if you compare dose reduction to maintenance therapy, after seven years, those who had had dose reduction had a higher level of recovery. So. We would like to ask ourselves the question, is it possible to carry out uh, guided dose reduction in some, and in some cases discontinuation? So we have prepared a new trial which after endless discussions with authorities, hopefully <laughs> can start within weeks or months. I hope it's weeks. Uh, but we are going to uh, recruit uh, 250 patients from Opus teams who are in remission uh, after a uh, psychotic episode. And then we will randomize them to uh, slowly, uh, closely, slowly reduction with closely monitoring of uh, symptoms. And the others should continue on a fixed dose. Of course, it can be changed due to side effects or lack of effect. And these uh, four enthusiastic women will carry out the trial. We're looking forward to that. Yeah. And then um, experiments, uh, and there are several experiments that could be uh, carried out. I think we had a session, we had two sessions yesterday about virtual reality, uh, and I think that's really great. Uh, uh, and I think um, it, it could also be about dealing with uh, voices and, well, the use of virtual reality in uh, cognitive therapy is, uh, I think there's a very good, there are very good arguments for that. Uh, cognitive uh, therapy aim to change negative beliefs into positive forms of action, and exposure is an important element. And virtual reality can organize uh, that exposure. I've pictured Lucia Valmachia, who is one of the key figures in the field of uh, virtual reality. Uh, and virtual reality has uh, for a long time been used to train behavior. Uh, fly simulators, parachute training, surgery, public speaking, and avoiding falling. I've actually tried this public speaking. The audience is very friendly. So, <laughs> but it is a way to train. We could also put it into social skills training, maybe, uh, to, to train, a, but of course, they also train in groups. But it, it could also be used in phobia, and it has been used in phobia, all these uh, different kind of things you can be afraid of. To be exposed to those things in a virtual reality environment can be uh, effective, I think. And it, it could be to get such a large spider <laughs> right in your face, or thunder. If you're afraid of thunder, you can have a very vivid experience of, of thunder uh, in, uh, in virtual reality scenario. And there are some examples, that we've heard more of them in, at this conference, where it's used also uh, with delusions, uh, where you try to uh, treat persecutory delusions. This is a study from uh, Daniel Freeman, uh, published this uh, summer, uh, where they, they try to uh, uh, make people more uh, able to stay in a train with many people. Uh, so going into a train with more and more people trying to skip safety behavior. So it's a virtual train. Yeah. And they, they did some, they achieved some reduction in delusional convictions and real world distress. So I, I think it's, it is promising and I think it is uh, it's very interesting for us that this field is uh, starting to expand. There's also the Avatar trial from UK. It's, we haven't got the results yet, but what they're trying is to negotiate with the voices uh, while they are picturing the, the, uh, the person who says the voice, and they, they do that by drawing it uh, with help of uh, some people who are used to uh, portray offenders. Uh, uh, so so they, uh, 
they draw a picture of the, of the voice, and they can also make the voice sound like the voice they hear in in the in their head. So they are together with their therapist exploring how they can deal with, with those voices. I think it's very interesting, but we don't know uh, if it's effective yet. But I think such kind of experience are very interesting experiments. And then inflammatory um, mechanisms, I've pictured three people from my team, Michael Benros, Sonja Orlovska, and Ole Köhler, uh, who is going to uh, explore whether inflammatory mechanisms can uh, be responsible for some of the mental disorders. I don't know if you were aware of the tiny polar bear Knut who died in Berlin. It was due to anti-NDMA receptor encephalitis. And do we overlook uh, such uh, diseases? Another example, apart from the polar bear, is this um, uh, famous journalist, uh, Susanna Kahlan, who uh, had one month of severe uh, mental illness while she also had an anti-DMA uh, encephalitis. And she was cured and she's now back and functioning. So, um, and we know that um, uh, virus infections during pregnancy can cause uh, brain damage. And we also had very bad experience in the past where uh, neurosyphilis, uh, syphilis in third stage, uh, uh, one third of the patients in mental hospitals suffered and died from this disorder, and the discovery of penicillin uh, solved that problem uh, totally due, uh, after a few years. So uh, we are starting a, a new initiative, we call it PsychFlame, where we are starting to uh, draw spinal fluid from uh, patients with uh, psychosis. In order to, uh, what we hope is that we discover uh, the small proportion, uh, it's likely to be a, a rather small proportion, but we don't know yet, uh, that uh, can be treated with uh, other uh, treatment paradigms. And eventually we'll also uh, take part in trials where we will um, find out if uh, other treatment paradigms are effective. But I think it's a new area. Yeah, and then expansion to other areas. Pat has already touched upon that, uh, and uh, that um, mental disorders are uh, treatment of, uh, are diseases of the youth. You can see here the uh, brown uh, area. It's where mental disorder is uh, is uh, present. We have uh, we have had a, a, a Danish uh, uh, burden of disease report where it was shows that the cost of treatment. Um, it's not only schizophrenia, it's also depression, anxiety, and substance abuse. And if we look at early age pensioning, all the mental disorders are at the top list. So I think it is, uh, it, it's not only uh, schizophrenia and psychosis, it's also other disorders. And here I have a picture just showing the um, incidence of uh, different disorders. And what we can see is, apart from organic disorders, dementia, it's in the old age. But uh, uh, substance misuse, affective disorders, and schizophrenia, it's uh, diseases that occur in the young uh, age. So we, we should think about it. It's not that we should not think about diseases in, in the old age, but, but still, yeah. So uh, what can we do uh, still if we go back to uh, this figure of uh, faces in psychosis? I'll not touch upon shortening duration of untreated psychosis and the famous TIPS project, uh, but uh, I'll look upon... Uh, uh, the uh, UHR, treatment in the UHR group. And I think we do now have evidence for the effectiveness of CBT to prevent transition um, to psychotic symptoms in uh, ultra high risk groups. And it is uh, thanks to Mark's, uh, Mark van der Gaak who presented this in uh, schizophrenia research some years ago where it's a, met it's a meta analysis demonstrating that uh, if we compare across all the randomized uh, clinical trials, um, uh, the uh, ability to um, prevent transition is larger in the group that has received uh, some kind of uh, CBT. Yeah, so that's what we know, but um, um, a lot more could happen in the UHR group. And uh, we are conducting a uh, trial which we call the FOCUS trial, where we uh, try to, to uh, give uh, cognitive uh, remediation, uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's brain training, it's compensatory strategies, and it's training in, in social cognition. So we combine these uh, three uh, elements in a trial where we are, have planned to recruit 126 uh, patients. And uh, the social cognition, it's uh, among other things, uh, it includes uh, recognition of uh, emotions. 
here it's not that difficult. But uh, we have uh, been, uh, we are applying the skit uh, um, um, a manual for social cognition training, and it is, it's more ambiguous situations such as this one. Uh, so spotting uh, the, the characters in, in these pictures, it's, it's not as easy as it is in the, in the Disney world. It's David Roberts who has uh, developed it and he's supervising us. Uh, but sadly, I think it, we are not the only ones who have found evidence that there are already brain changes present in uh, UHR uh, patients. Here is Christine Krakauer who compared uh, 45 UHR patients to matched healthy controls and, and found uh, uh, subtle uh, abnormalities in white matter microstructure in the UHR group. And I think uh, there are other uh, samples that, uh, where, where the same has been found. So maybe uh, I think Shirish Kapoor, he wants to ask me how early is too late. I don't think we should say that it's too late to intervene in the UHR group, but it is maybe late. So we, we should think of also intervening earlier in support for children at risk. Uh, and I'd like to show this figure, which was developed uh, by Rudolf Uhr, uh, where he showed that the different uh, possibilities for intervening. And of course, there's a possibility for intervening in the UHR group, the at-risk mental state, uh, the prodrome, or what you call it. And much work has been uh, carried out by Alison Young and Pat McGorry and a lot of other people. Um, but there's also things about the antecedents, and that was, and Thorup was uh, explaining this morning, there's a possibility to intervene before we get into the prodromal phase, where there are uh, maybe other uh, characteristics uh, uh, already present in the, in the antecedent uh, phase, or characterizing the antecedent phase. And then there could be this with the risk factors, and that's often much more difficult to intervene uh, uh, with the, regard to distal risk factors. Yeah, but uh, if we look at the children at risk, I think Anne already showed this. Uh, it is a, um, a study carried out by Anne Ranning, uh, who defended her PhD recently, where she showed that uh, children with parents with schizophrenia have quite different uh, um, places uh, to grow up compared to the, uh, the children who do not have those, uh, the, whose whose mothers do not have schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, or depression. You can see here that 60% um, of those kids, until the age of six, uh, 18, they grow up with both parents. But over here, when it's mothers with schizophrenia, it's only 20%. And uh, there's a large proportion here of, uh, I think it's 35%, who end up not living with any of their parents. And here we have all the single mothers with schizophrenia. It's 20% all through the childhood. Uh, single mothers with schizophrenia who live uh, with the child. So I think there are a lot of things to be uh, thought about and, uh, and Thoreau presented our work with the Danish uh, High Risk and Resilience Study, which we are very proud of. And uh, it has been an endeavor carried out by a lot of people and uh, 522 families. Uh, and we could see already at the age of seven that there are um, a, more higher risk of any lifetime uh, child psychiatric diagnosis already at the age of uh, seven. And we could also see that, that that's present in both the uh, schizophrenia group and the bipolar group. It's children, seven-year-old children with parents with schizophrenia or parents with bipolar disorder. Uh, and we could see what kind of uh, disorders it is. It is uh, mainly anxiety and ADHD, which is higher uh, than in the... Um, in the control group. And we also can see that um, the level of functioning is lower among the children already at the age seven in, in the schizophrenia group. So there's a lot of work to be done also in this group. And I think Anne explained that we, uh, we should try to find out how we can intervene earlier. And one example could be the via family study. There are other examples around the world. Uh, Ru uh, Rudolf Uhr has a study called SWELL, where they also try to uh, intervene uh, in, in, uh, in the antecedent phase. Yeah, now it's only uh, my time to thank all the people who helped us and inspired us, and there are many more than those uh, on, the, on this slide. Um, I'm especially grateful to Barack Obama again. <laughs> um, 
And then I have a lot of collaborators, uh, and uh, I'm not even sure I've caught everybody, but the, I'm very grateful for the collaboration I've had with all these people. And here's a picture of some of them. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the very in-depth and the comprehensive uh, great talk. Um, uh, my name is Young uh, from uh, uh, South Korea. Uh, if I may, uh, I want to uh, make uh, two uh, personal comments. Uh, one thing is uh, whenever I come to attend IAPA, uh, I feel always challenged, challenged and uh, stimulated by the pioneering uh, the researcher and the colleague. Uh, and um, in an oriental expression, uh, the, the colleague with the same vision and hope is called uh, Do Ban. Uh, uh, Do is uh, uh, a great path or truth, and Ban, Ban is a companion. So it's a companion with the same uh, vision and hope. So uh, one great thing is finding a good doban here. And uh, another thing is um, in November, uh, Pat uh, will visit Korea. And uh, we have arranged uh, a meeting with uh, a government official uh, in order to uh, explain and persuade them uh, to set aside a, a certain budget for uh, our first episode uh, uh, psychosis study. So uh, with this uh, budget, uh, we really hope to expand to the uh, uh, intervention study. Right now in Korea, we are conducting the, the naturalistic observational uh, follow-up study, a five-year project. So we want to expand to the intervention study in the future. All right, um, can we have Kechan uh, to Merit. No. Uh, yeah. And any question from the floor to Merit? We can have one or two questions. Yeah, please. Yeah. Alan Rose in Sydney. Hi. Um, what are the, your hypotheses about the increase in uh, incidence of psychosis in Denmark and what implications that that got for the rest of us? Well, uh, we have posed uh, three uh, hypotheses as far as I remember. Uh, one is that the, the, um, the capacity for treatment has increased, so maybe the destigmatizing of, uh, of the health services uh, would encourage more people to seek help. It could also be that the uh, diagnostic uh, system uh, is used more rigorously uh, compared to previously. And I think especially amongst the youngest, uh, the, uh, up to 18 years old, that might be true. That because in child psychiatry there's been uh, hesitation against full implementation of the ICD-10. The third hypothesis is that it's a true finding. It's not only about diagnosis or, or services available. And in, in that case, it's more worrying because uh, what could cause that? Actually, the, 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 <laughs> the reason for starting this study was because somebody said if um, cannabis was, was really that dangerous, we would have seen an increase, and we didn't see that, the person claimed. And they said, oh, we'll have to look for it, and we found an increase. I will, will not claim that it's because of increasing use of cannabis, but we should think of, of factors in the society that could increase uh, the risk of psychosis. And, and we do not have uh, strong candidates for that. But I think the two other explanations are evident that it is also because of the treatment uh, uh, available, the treatment is available and that the diagnosis is used more rigorously. Okay. Uh, 
I think we can have uh, one more question, if any. No? Okay, um, then w with that, uh, uh, we will close the session and uh, uh, thank you for the merit. Uh, thank you all for participating in this session. Okay.